I'm really glad that we have this chance to sit down and talk to you. Um, so I know Amanda from her work in Open UK. If you do not know Open UK, you'll have a chance to hear about that now. She has enormous experience uh, in open source and legal implication, but one of the areas where she is championing open source is working with government and small companies, being a voice of small companies in the parliament. So thanks, Amanda, for letting me correct my mess up. And please, can you uh, start by telling a bit uh, about you, uh, Open UK, and how all the conversation that we are having here today is relevant to that. Thank you very much for having me along. And I'm really sorry, I should have been on the 1020 panel. Um, I have ADHD, and if it's not on my calendar, I don't do it. So uh, it wasn't in my calendar, so I didn't do it. Um, so I think it's probably my fault. But I'm quite happy to talk to you about anything I know about today. And my background is that I'm the CEO of Open UK and we are an industry organization with a difference. So we're four years old and instead of being an industry organization that brings together companies, we bring together people. And we've realized that that instinct four years ago actually is for a very good reason, which is when you look at many of the people who are involved in open technology and we'll get onto what open technology is in a moment, um, they work for international companies from the UK. So if we only focused on the UK companies, like most of the other open source organizations in geographic areas, we would end up with a few companies who were engaged with us. Whereas I think particularly in the UK, because of the English speaking nature of the country, we, we end up with a lot of people working, particularly in the US or in what I would call the international tech sector. And we often describe those people and the businesses that are part of it as the submarine under the digital economy, because we actually contribute a huge amount economically to the UK and to the digital tech sector or the tech sector. But we um, we're often not seen and we're not seen because we're more likely to work with people in other countries than our neighbours. We don't tend to be at a lot of events in the UK. We're all over the world meeting all the people we collaborate globally with. And uh, many of us work from home, so we just don't interact with that many people. So what we've discovered is there's a huge workforce in the UK who already do that. And we hope that we can build more of that in the UK because it's something we're really good at. And I think it really lends itself to the innovative nature of people in the UK. So a long way of explaining that we focus on people and we rely on the companies to come behind the people. We then don't focus on open source software alone. We focus on open tech. And what that means, we've talked about three pillars, traditionally software, hardware, data. And those are really what we focus on. And my board, my leadership team, we believe that that covers everything. But what we've seen with AI is that's not always clear to people. So we now talk a bit about open standards and open AI. So anything that's open, we look at and we try to bring into the conversation. And our goal is UK leadership and global collaboration in open technology. So we are trying to build out what we think is already a center of excellence in the UK, gain recognition for that, gain more government funding for it, make it easier for SMEs in that space to get funded, for projects to grow here in the UK. So there's all sorts of different pieces in that jigsaw that we're trying to pull together. Um, my personal background is that I was a lawyer for 25 years and most of those were spent in companies. I stopped doing that five years ago. Um, in 2008, almost 16 years ago, I guess, I joined a company called Canonical that I'm sure some of you will know, um, based out of London. And I think I was employee 185. Uh, I was the general counsel, so I managed the legal requirements globally. And I was there five years, which if any of you have worked in that kind of startup is like, you know, 30 or 40 years in a real company. Um, and it was a strange experience because I worked all over the world and I think I did two deals in five years in Europe, not just the UK, but in Europe, one uh, with a company based out of Luxembourg and repeated small deals with one big UK company because the UK just wasn't engaging. And what we had were gatekeepers. We had legal, we had procurement, we had finance that stopped uh, open source being adopted in their companies. In the last 10 years, particularly the last three to five, we've seen a shift. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. The ones that I always pick out are digitalization, which has changed the role of engineers. So engineers are able to have more say in what's going on. But I think the, the, the repos, now I'm 
from Canonical. So I was using Launchpad, but whatever you're using, GitHub, GitLab, whatever it is, the accessibility of code and the ability to just bring code into your organization, I think is the key thing that has shifted in the last few years. And from a, you know, a risk perspective, there is reason to tell you about all of this. From a risk perspective, what that's done is move from your gatekeepers because you don't need money. You can just bring it in. So you don't go through finance approval. You don't go through procurement. You don't go through legal. Instead, what you should be looking at for your risk profile is policy, your internal policies and processes. And when we talk about policy back in 2012, I was on a cabinet office advisory group and the UK, I think it was 2011, 12, had the first open source first policy in its public sector. Except that policy is still the policy we have today. And what we don't really have are the processes behind it. So if you look around companies, the policies that I'm talking about that you need to manage risk are often not there. Or if they are there, they, they aren't backed by processes. And if you don't have that, your engineers are going to do what they want. And it needs to be done the right way. In the public sector, we have an open source first policy, but actually it's not always honored. It doesn't have teeth. And even if it is honored, government uses open source generally to avoid lock-in if they're bringing code in. And if they're creating code, they do it to create code that will be recycled and reused. So from that perspective, you don't really achieve that if you don't have a broader picture beyond just saying that you put it on GitHub with an open source license is what you do is you create a wild west of code that nobody's ever going to use. So as you sort of move forward with Open UK and the, the lobbying and the policy work that we do, and you look at AI, what it does is sort of match our remit. And our remit is to look at all the different aspects of openness. So open data, open source software. You've probably noticed that there's a lot of disagreement. Some of it is very informed and some of it's very ill-informed around what open AI is, what open source AI is, what open source is in AI. And we're all sort of finding our way at this stage, I think. But if you go back to what I'm talking about in terms of open source software, what you see is usage that isn't matched by understanding. Usage that isn't matched by policy and processes. And there's a sort of disconnect where we're catching up and the world is still looking at a proprietary way of dealing with things, although we're in an open world. And when you look at Synopsys does a report every year, they've just done it, I've not read it yet. So use their figures from last year. Last year, they said 96% of code bases had open source dependencies and 76% of code was open source. Now that's mainly your infrastructure. So consumers don't feel that as much because open source hasn't done so well in that consumer space and it probably won't for a long time. But um, when you then match that onto AI, we've got these similar concerns and issues, right? And the first one I think is to understand what you're talking about. So I don't know about AI, I'm learning about AI as are most people, if they're honest. I do know about open source and I know a bit about open data. And I know that if I look at AI, there is software algorithms that could be licensed on open source licenses. Then there's, co um, then there's data and the data doesn't belong in an open source license. The data belongs on a data license in the same ways we've encouraged developers for years not to use things like Creative Commons for code because it doesn't work. We, haven't, we, we need to encourage people to use data licenses. And you know, my personal view is that we probably should disaggregate the component parts and look at what they are. Many of you will have seen Gemini come out in the last week or so, and they, there's a Google blog that's the official blog, and there's also a Google OSPO blog that's interesting. And it gets into that debate about, you know, what is an open AI? What is an open source AI? Um, we had our conference on the 6th and 6th of February. I think the date's right. All of the content from that is on um, stateofopencon.com or you can get it from openuk.uk. And we had uh, two hours of plenaries around opening up AI and AI openness as we tend to refer to it as. And then there were discussions across the board on AI that might be interesting to you. Um, the... LLM report had just come out of the House of Lords and Baroness Stowell did a keynote, which was the first public discussion that the Lords had done. 
and we are quoted. I don't think our response is the best in the world. And if I'm honest with you, we didn't know because we're tiny and we're trying to do a lot. We didn't know that we had to meet a deadline in September. We didn't know that was happening. So they let us put a late submission in. But even to do that, I had to do the first draft on a flight coming back from the States overnight. So, I mean, there are a couple of words that are wrong and there are things that in our recent AI report we've corrected. So there are mistakes in it, but it helped. And it helped, I think, mainly in the one thing that the Lord's quoted from Open UK. And the thing they quoted was, when you look at openness and AI, it's a bit like looking at how you regulate the roads. So you'll have a bicycle on the road, a scooter, a car, an HGV vehicle. All of them are vehicles. They all travel on the road and they all go from A to B. And AI openness is similar. You've got all these different gradients of openness that have different impacts, that have different risks. So if you're looking at something that's on an open source license that's OSI approved, you'll have a complete free flow. There will be no restriction on who uses it, no restriction on how they use it. If you look at something like LAMA2, which Open UK supported, remember we are keen on a whole range of opens and what we wanted was a shift in the right direction. So we felt we could support it. It wasn't as far as we wanted it to go, but it was going the right way. If you look at LAMA2, 700 million users in your usage, and you then have to go back to Meta and get a commercial license. Nobody knows what the terms of that license are and they're not obligated to give it to you. So what they then have is the potential to control the ecosystem. Now that's a very different kind of open from something that anybody can use for any purpose. It doesn't mean it's not open in some form, but it's not traditional open source. Um, and I, I think that understanding is really important and the different gradients of openness and shades of openness, because what you have to understand is what it means and what the actual risk is. And something I keep saying to regulators, to policymakers, to politicians, is that risk isn't necessarily a bad thing. What matters is understanding the risks you're taking and choosing what your risk tolerance is. So being informed, having good understanding, taking the time to understand properly. And I think the UK actually is in a position just now where we might have an advantage that we didn't mean to have. So I don't believe that we are so late to regulate because we intended that fully, although, you know, some people are taking that. Um, I think what's happened is we have a two year delay with Brexit and then we've got a situation right now where no regulation is coming through for whatever reason. I'm sure after the election that will shift, but right now it's not happening. And what that means is we've actually got time to pause to properly understand what it is we're talking about, which I don't think other regulators and governments have when they've created regulation. You couldn't, because it's moving so fast. You just couldn't keep up with that in your drafting. And what we've avoided is creating unnecessarily restrictive regulation that will inhibit innovation. Now, what that could mean for the UK is that we could have a late mover advantage and we could create somewhere that has traditionally been the voice of reason and regulation in Europe and bring that into the UK and bring a lot of investment and a lot of innovation, not just from the UK, but on a collaborative basis. And we could actually lift this dream I have of us being not just a center of excellence, but the place that you come to for openness into the AI space. So I guess that's what Open UK is. I have two questions. The first panel really talked about, um, we use the term standing on the shoulder of giants. And then I talk to folks and they're like, but actually standing on this tiny person in Nebraska. So um, talking from that, we were mostly discussing, you know, we are not doing things for the first time in the world. The companies before us have done it. How can we learn from that? And the community came up a lot. Um, and of course, the conference that you hosted was a massive community gathering of all kinds of sectors. Could you share some of the examples or uh, what Chris actually mentioned, FUD, yeah. the fear, uncertainty, fear, and, uncertainty doubt. and doubt? It, it sort of goes with openness and it goes with disruption. It's not just about openness. Anything that's disruptive will be surrounded in fear, uncertainty and doubt, because if you are the incumbent, you don't love it. Um, and you don't love it because it's going to disrupt your revenue. So 
for me, you know, joining Canonical and the operating system space in 2008, Microsoft was public enemy number one. That shifted. They're now the biggest contributor to open source. But who knows where this whole AI conversation is going to take them and, you know, the litigation that's going on. There's actually a piece in the tele, um, not the Telegraph, in the couldn't be more opposite the Guardian this morning giving examples of problems in open source and talking about heartbleed and talking about how uh, you're you know one guy called bill is now maintaining this piece of software that is actually a critical dependency for eight million platforms kind of thing and it is a real issue and i think we're at a super interesting point in time in the history of open source that ought to impact our thinking around ai and the, the, the point in time I believe we're at is where we're maturing, right? So it's 25 years-ish since the open source definition, 30 odd years since free software. What you've seen in my view is a correction of the way IP was applied to software. So until 60s and 70s, you could collaborate around code there wasn't regulation. Copyright was applied to code, and once copyright was applied, you needed a license. And that meant nobody could use your code without a license, which meant you had control. And that control has been used to build these massive vats of money for companies, right? And I mean, effectively, it is money because you're sitting on patents, you're sitting on code that nobody can use unless you give them access. And that's allowed them to become de facto standards that are very restricted. So then you see the whole open movement becoming something, I suppose, in a way, it also almost comes out of civil society where people take back control and start to just say, OK, I waive my right. You can share this with me. We can all work together. And that's sort of where I came into open source in my career. And we wanted everybody to adopt it. And we've got it now and we've won, except it's painful. And what we're seeing is imbalances economically between the users and the companies who have built multi-billion dollar companies on open source and the small group of people, and it is quite a small group of people at its heart, who uh, actually contribute to it and make that, that work. And that imbalance isn't something that's going to be able to continue ad infinitum. People are not going to come into that. You know, everybody needs to eat, everybody needs to live. There has to be some sort of recalibration. I honestly, for open source, I don't know what the answer to that is just now, but it's something that I and others are doing a lot of thinking about. And it's whether there needs to be license changes, whether we need to look at how we force users to contribute back. And it's not just about money, because you can throw money at people if they haven't got the resource, it doesn't shift things. And I think there's um, a major issue which is around understanding because the kind of people who build this stuff don't tend to go out and shout about what they do and you need more people like me who can go and tell their stories and be credible in front of policymakers and regulators and we need to build that out more which means that we need to build more understanding and going back to our conference the way that we have run it for the first two years at least is that we have plenaries for two hours each morning and we have conversations publicly that normally happen behind closed doors and open source. And those conversations are around the key policy issues and we bring some of the policy people in. Often you have to be on a board of a particular open source project, which may cost you hundreds of thousands of years to be, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to be on to get into those conversations. And what we're trying to do is democratize understanding so to bring that so that the engineers, the people involved in these communities actually understand what's really going on on the policy side and how it impacts them. So again, I think this all links back to AI because we have to have these discussions about AI in an informed way and in a broader way, understanding that you might not like this. I think AI is just another tool, right? I went through the dot-com bubble, I don't know how long ago, 25, 30 years ago. And, you know, that was something that has stayed with us and we couldn't have imagined the impact the internet was going to have on people's lives. But I've also been through other bubbles that have burst and not become a thing. So whether generative AI is really going to change the world, who knows? It certainly will have an impact. But it's another technology which we need to understand and we need to regulate if, if we need regulation or put a code of conduct in whatever it is in a, an appropriate way.
to my mind, we don't need as much regulation as people think. And the reason we don't need as much regulation is it's a technology tool in a use case. And when we're looking at AI, and when we're looking at open source software too, I would push it all back onto the user, the business user. So if it's a consumer product, whoever's supplying that consumer product is liable. If it's B2B and you're in a regulated sector, you can't offload that liability, you're stuck with it. So I think we need to think more about something being supplied the, you know, and created and then something being utilized and who should be responsible. So I think a business that selects a tool should be responsible for making sure it's fit for purpose. And so does the law, because the law doesn't allow that liability to shift. You might have an economic indemnity, but the liability generally won't move. So I, I think there's a whole picture around AI where that kind of understanding needs to become part of the conversation. We'll take... If I'm talking too long, no, just no, stop me. No, no, this is your stage, Amanda. Folks, do we have a question uh, for Amanda here? Yeah, at the back. I'll pass the mic for it. Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah. Or I can talk about it, maybe. And tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Sean. Uh, oh. hmm. Hello? I can project. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Thank you very much. I'm Sean. I actually was going to speak to Denver. I was speaking about AI and co-creation, and I was looking, f I was just like going to work for some hours, and then I heard that there was an AI conference, so I came in. Um, because that's just where we're at. You're always working on it. Um, I think open source is super interesting. So like, but that's another kind of question. I'm just thinking about, you start talking about like business liability, especially when you think about like wrappers, right? Like most businesses will be built on top of APIs. Um, and do you think, like, obviously you have your policies and disclaimers and things like this, but especially when it becomes like IP usage of, of users, do you think that the most of the liability will fall on these larger companies that are like allowing people to use their APIs or how do you think that's going to play out? I think it's going to be something that disaggregates. So where you look at the output and the IP there, I think who owns it and I think who's liable for it might not be the same thing. And I think that the answer, for example, to who owns it will depend on what's gone in and where it's come from. So if you're using pre-trained models to create something, that data has not been configured, selected by you or provided by you, I think the provider is likely to be liable on the IP front. If, however, you're using a tool and you're selecting the data that goes in, I think you will be accountable. And then I think the, the general ownership of the output will also sit with the questioner, not the creator. So there's going to be lots of different bits to this. It does raise the question, right, whether copyright's outdated. I mean, I, I, I will say this, although it's only my opinion that patents are long overdue or refresh. You know, they're a monopoly and they were granted to encourage innovation. That was the whole point of a pattern. And clearly in the tech space, they don't do that. They stifle innovation. So for me, it's long overdue that we move beyond them. But whether copyright is actually also fit for purpose in a digital world is another question. Now, we're not going to change that quickly. So we're going to have to work within those constraints. And it's going to be difficult. So I often tell people working in AI, a story about when I was in the dot-com boom and I worked for an ISP, I was the first lawyer and there were no laws around the internet and we were lobbying to create the laws that we needed without understanding where that was going to go, right? So things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 2000, which has been in place until not long ago and completely not fit for purpose. But the kind of activities we did as lawyers trying to fit the old world into this new technology were things like linking agreements. Have you ever heard of a linking agreement? So every website owner who wanted to link to another website would do a formal contract. 
really. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how that would have scaled? And I think we're going through that same process where we're trying to apply traditional law to something it doesn't really fit around and the practices that we know. And there'll be a time of doing that and then a time of letting it go because it just doesn't work and working out what does work. And going back to talking to sort of politicians and regulators, when I'm talking to them, I'm suggesting that they create 10 principles that you want to apply to all digital in your country and your environment and that every piece of legislation would follow those principles but also that you would look at having something that's really agile and flexes because as we move forward we're going to have to keep changing and if we have to go through these big slow regulatory processes that we're going through now it's just never going to work and that's what's been wrong with social media and the way the internet laws have applied to social because we didn't have that flex um you don't need to know this but i think it's vaguely relevant in scotland where i trained first as a lawyer we don't follow precedent in our courts we go back to some principles from the jurists from hundreds of years ago and you can argue that that overrides a recent case and it's probably what influences my thinking as well as agile technology you don't have to be restricted by the recent past you can look at what's right in the bigger picture and it can work and you know a lot of the civil uh, law countries make that work so maybe going to something more like that that has some base principles that we want to achieve and that creating you know high level flexible regulation for tech and then knowing that regulated sectors are regulated so anything that's used in that space has to meet that regulation might be the way forward i think so uh, can you please ask question in the lunch um and yeah no thanks so much amanda for the flexibility and thank you for sharing about open uk and your work amanda is a connector so please do find her a chat with her yeah so I'll be here for a short time. Um, Open UK is not a pay to play organization. So anyone can participate. We're very small in terms of our resource and we're very big in terms of our volunteer community. And we're going through a refresh of our AI advisory board as part of all of our advisory boards being refreshed. So if anybody's interested in getting involved, um, admin at openuk.uk is like the default email for everything Open UK. And um, please follow us on social and things because there might be events and stuff that you're interested in and we'd love to have you. Brilliant. Please uh, give a round of applause to Amanda.